In 1970, an openly gay man named David Vast was launching his career as a lighting and tech director when he was hired to oversee the sound and lighting at the Continental Baths, which were housed around the giant swimming pool under the Insonia Hotel on New York City's Upper West Side. The Baths, as it was called, was a popular gay men's sex club and cruising space, and at 48,000 square feet, it was massive. While well, it was successful as a not-so secret sex club, the Baths owner, Steve Ostro, decided that on Saturday nights he'd add live entertainment and hired the then-relatively unknown singer Bette Midler, who had been a cast member in the original 1967 Broadway run of Fiddler on the Roof, to perform once a week under a three-month contract at $50 a gig. She later renegotiated him up to $100 a pop. It was the most primitive sound and lighting cabaret system in all of NYC. I think Vast tells people exclusively of having to figure out how to make the sound work for both Midler and the Bass in-house pianist, a then unknown Barry Manilow. I made lighting out of tin cans, used my friends who were backup singers to borrow good microphones from their studio sessions. I couldn't use a spotlight because it was a basement and the ceiling was very low. It was a mess, Vass says. Barry Manilow could never keep the piano tuned because of all the humidity. Still, he'll never forget watching Bette Midler become a superstar after those bathhouse gigs. It was an instant success, but he says some of the patrons, who were there to meet other men, were initially confused. Some of the regular guys who frequented the baths scratched their heads, wondering, what was this woman with wild red hair, in thrift shop clothes, and outrageous makeup doing here, standing by the piano and singing tunes from the 40s and cracking body jokes? He says with a laugh. However, it wasn't long before the regulars and then a host of celebrities became fans of her show. Suddenly, A-listers and socialites were lining up to get in on Saturday nights, Vass recalls. Alfred Hitchcock, Andy Warhol, Mick Jagger, Truman Capote, Lisa Minnelli, Rita Marino, Princess Margaret, Valentino, Carol Channing, David Bowie, Lee Radswell, Bob Foss, and Gwen Vernon, you name it. They loved Bathhouse Betty, and it was the place to be seen on Saturday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight. There were paparazzi lined up outside, trying to get shots of all the famous people who came. Vass says that before each show, Midler would sing the Star Spangled Banner a cappella before launching into her act. She knew the audience would stand up for it, along with the gay Bathhouse patrons, many of whom dropped their towels and mooned the celebrity audiences, he says with a laugh. Bet had an outrageous sense of humor and always got off on that moment. She knew how to handle her audiences always with humor and a wink. He says Midler would then launch into her set, most of which were retro tunes from 30s female singing groups like the Andrews Sisters. In between songs, she let out a stream of salty jokes, and she had two backup singers named the Harlots. The original ones were Melissa Manchester and Sissy Houston, Whitney's mom. Originally, there were velvet ropes to envelope the folding chairs for the mostly straight, very trendy patrons to watch the show from, to keep then contained from what was happening in the back rooms, Vass says. But it only took a few weeks and the Saturday night glitterati would sneak off and explore. And let me tell you, did they get an eyeful? There were candy dispensers filled with small packets of KI, the dispensers at the entrance to the two showers filled with a medication to use to kill lice. The water fountain was filled with mouthwash. Vass says by the time Midler's three-month contract was up, she had signed a record deal with Atlantic Records. Her first album, The Divine Miss M., would be released in 1972, and she skyrocketed to stardom from there, winning a Grammy for Best New Artist in 1974.